sing on the psalms that have a little superscription in front of it. As far as I know, they're all written by David that have that, and they are hearkening back to an experience and a time, a thing that he was going through. <clears throat> but what the scriptures are giving us is not just the external circumstances, not just the external reactions or manifestations that we see, but we are <clears throat> we're actually getting from the Psalms an interior response to that. And in Psalm 34, the superscription says this, a Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Ahimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. <clears throat> All right. So to really get the, the gist of this, keep your place here in Psalm 34. Let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And we'll read the incident where it happened. <clears throat> now in chapter, chapter 20, there has been a final closure between David and Jonathan. <clears throat> there has been weeping and hugging and... Uh, A, a departure that appears to be basically final between them, Jonathan being the son of King Saul. And so David flees to Nob, and um, there in Nob is <coughs> the tabernacle at this time, the priest, the high priest, and and David is, uh, he's on the run, and he doesn't, he doesn't know where he's going to go, he doesn't know what he's going to do, he doesn't have any plans, but he goes to the priests, and there he talks with them, and then David says when he gets ready to depart at verse uh, 9 of chapter 21, I'm sorry, verse 8. And David said unto Ahimelech, <clears throat> And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the qu king's business required haste. What was the king's business that required haste on the part of David? Yeah, he was trying to kill him. The king's business was he was trying to kill David. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, in verse 9, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other except that here. And David said, there's none like that. Give it to me. <clears throat> and if you remember the story, and I'm sure you do, David was the one who killed Goliath. And so now David is taking the sword of Goliath. And um, um, verse 10. And this starts getting into the superscription over Psalm 34. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? You know, this, this little saying is going to kill David. <laughs> you know, I'm sure when you first heard it, you're going, Oh, this is cool until you realize, you know, you're popping your head up uh, like a turkey in the woods and somebody's going to shoot it off. <clears throat> and David laid up these words in his heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. 
Um, and by the way, this place that he went to, Achish and Gath and all this, this is Philistine com country. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and made marks on the door of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see the man is mad or crazy. Why then have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? <clears throat> and so... What this is basically saying is that David has, um, he's running from Saul. Saul is his enemy, and it says that he was afraid of Saul. That's verse uh, 10. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. Okay. What we do is we, we get myopia. We, we, get, we start focusing on one enemy. One enemy, and so David, all he can think about is Saul is out to kill him. <clears throat> and so he knows I'm going out on my own now, I need a weapon. So he drops off and he gets Goliath's sword. And then the next place he shows up is among the Philistines, carrying Goliath's sword, looking for help. Thinking, I'm running from my enemies. And not knowing, you, that's one guy. All of these guys hate you. They're all out to get you. And especially come prancing in here with Goliath's sword. You know. And so, um, so I want you to notice that, number one, David was young. <clears throat> okay? David was very young. Also want you to notice that the great man... King David, he's not here yet. He hadn't showed up yet. He's in the making. He's in making. God, he, he is in progress. Please be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. He's in process, okay? And, and let's just say it right out. He makes foolish decisions at this point. He's just at the beginning of everything. And he makes foolish decisions. And, um, and he thinks in terms of, he'd just gotten all caught up with Saul, that's my enemy, and walks into the, a greater enemy's camp in a certain sense, brandishing Goliath's sword and really hacking off all of the Philistines. <coughs> and... Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, he was, uh, Abimelech here is really not a name. If you'll go through, and I've got a bunch of scriptures, one, two, three, at least three other scriptures that use that name for Philistine guys, and it's not a name. It's similar to the name Pharaoh that can apply to anybody that was over Egypt, was the Pharaoh. Well, the Abimelech is the Philistine name that they used over and over and over, and it always seems to be the name for a king, so it couldn't possibly be their name. It's a, it's a title uh, for the king. <coughs> um, but um, let's, let me just read a sentence here. Goliath came from there, came from the Philistines, so they hated the one who killed their champion. And uh, <clears throat> so David, so, and they say to Abimelech, the, the head guy, this guy, and they call David king. Well, he wasn't king. I mean, he was in God's eyes and apparently in the Philistines' eyes, but not in Saul's eyes. Saul, King Saul, said, I'm king. And they said, man, this guy's a danger. He killed our champion. He killed the biggest, tallest, meanest man alive. And so David, being a young guy, starts trying to think his way through this. And the only thing he could come up with is to start, stand there and start scratching on the gate. <sighs> 
and, and, and letting slobber run down. <laughs> and, and, and I guess he knew that in their culture back then, if you, were, if you had problems like that, that they figured you were under the protection of the gods so they wouldn't kill you anyway. They, you know, they were in danger if they killed you. So it was a, it was a good move, but it wasn't a god move. Yes. Is this Heil Hitler or you want to? Okay. Good, because I'm Jewish. <laughs> that was that was in the Bible when a man, um, the man comes up and walks among the tombs, you know, walk among the tombs. Right. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so um, at, at this point, David is alone, but he's, he wrote this down. He wrote Psalm 34 down, okay? And I want to make one other point out of these scriptures, and that is... Um, Chapter 22, right after we read all of what we read, the very next verse after that is chapter 22, verse 1. David therefore departed from there, from where? The Philistines, and escaped to the cave at Dulam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So, what we shared last class, or not last class, but the class before that, was about this cave and this whole thing, and we went to a psalm that talked about it. But now we're giving you information that happened just prior to this, okay? Um, and David is writing this psalm in, uh, and, and in fact, we can go on over to Psalm 34. In reaction and in understanding of this whole situation that just happened to him. And um, he says that when he got away from the Philistines, he escaped to the cave. He escaped. In other words, now he recognizes, I walked right in the big middle of the camp of the enemy. In other words, David became a mighty man of war. Did you know that? He, he was. And most of the time, when they went out to war, David led those men. Okay? Well, he wasn't that way here. Okay? He was just a boy. He's just learning about these kind of things. And, and we say... Um, you know, we were talking about Israel or, or the, these 400 men coming down to the cave at Dulem and gathering there with David. <clears throat> and I've made statements like, can you just see them sitting around the fireplace at night and David sharing the word and sharing the Lord? You remember me saying stuff like that? And that was immediately following this situation here that they gathered to him, okay? <clears throat> and we wonder, you know, how real is that picture that I think I got from the Lord when I share that with you? And maybe we wonder, if he did share, what did he share with them? Well, I'll tell you exactly what he shared with them. Exactly. I mean, exactly word for word. He shared Psalm 34. A psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed, and he went to the cave of Abdullah, and they gathered themselves to him, and he wrote this psalm. This is exactly. So if you, if you wonder, was David, because, you, okay, picture this. 400 people, and they're gathered. This must have been a pretty big cave. But they're gathered, and, they're, and here is David, 
And you remember, I mean, we, sh we shared on the other psalm that says what he shared when they went down to the cave at Dune. So he shared that, and he shared this at that specific time. And it was a, let me just say it like this, it was a lot of word. It was a lot of word. It was a lot of the word of God that he's sharing. And he's saying stuff like, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall muck or boast to the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord. This is, this is what David is saying to the discontented. This is what David is saying to the indebted. This is what, that, he's not talking about finances. He's not talking about how to fix your situation. He's talking about the Lord. And in that cave, while they're there, the only thing they're doing, folks, is hunting for food and sharing the word. And inside that cave, you have what you might, you might call it a total environment. You've got a you've got these people and you've got David and there is no priest. There is no priest. They've known priests since they came out of Egypt. There is no priest, but there is a man of God. There is a man, his name is David. David doesn't talk like the priest. David doesn't act like the priest. In fact, David acts like one of them. In fact, he acts worse. He acts crazy. You understand what I'm saying? He, he acts like he's insane or something. And, and he... he He's talking the word of God, but no, he's talking the Lord. And these guys are gathered in here, and he's sharing these kind of things. I mean, not these kind of, he's sharing this psalm with them. And he's pouring it out of reality, and we'll, that's what we're going to do when we get into this psalm. We're, we're going to see where it's coming from, where his words are coming from, that they're not just talking, oh, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times, his pray, you know, like most religious people do. He wrote it. He got it. He understood it. He came out of a bad situation immediately and wrote the inscription. This is where I got this from. That's, you, could, you could put that there. This is where I got this from, right here on this circumstances, going through this situation, and um, uh, what is it, verse uh, 11, he says, we're not jumping down there yet, but I want you to see something. Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> he's, n he's not talking to little children. Jesus said, except you become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Um, he's saying to those who, are, who will learn. And David is saying that, and David is young. You understand what I'm saying? David's just a young guy, but he's got something. And God knows he's got something, and he preserved it from cave till now. Pretty big deal. And God saw to it that that. What this man had to say, even at an early age, would be preserved because it's eternal. It's eternal. And it works in the circumstance. And it, and it was life to him. And so I just wanted you to see that David, halfway through this thing, because the first half up to verse 10, it's just a psalm of thanksgiving where he's just blessing the Lord and, and what have you. But after that, he goes into this mode of what, what most scholars call wisdom. But it is David sharing, David sitting as one who knows the Lord and says, this is the way we're going to proceed. We're brand new here. We're a brand new gathering. We're, there's 401 of us. 401, David's the extra one there. And here's our starting point. Here's, and I am going to not just be a captain over you, I'm going to be a priest over you if you understand what I'm saying. You know, David carried an ephod with him and would put it on and hear from the Lord. wonder where he got that. Well, it was, this sword was over there behind the ephod. Remember, we read that over there. I guess they just wrapped it up and handed it to him and he took it off with him. And that's where the, I always wondered where that thing showed up from. Because how did, you know, where, at what point did David ever get an ephod? 
right there when he got that when he got Goliath's sword. And so, um, so, so they gather up, and David is saying, "This is it. This is this is how this is our beginning. This is our seeds. This will be our foundation. This is who we are. You guys, listen. Come, ye children, listen. Hearken unto me, and I will teach you." The fear of the Lord. And he's going to describe to them what the true fear of the Lord is, which most of us say, well, the fear of the Lord is to go, I'm afraid of God. Well, David didn't seem afraid. He went into the Holy of Holies and danced when you weren't even supposed to go in there, you know? He, he comprehended at a young age what the true fear of the Lord was. And... He wanted everybody that followed him and that went after the Lord with him because he, he, he wasn't going to be a new government. He was going to be a people of God. That's what he set out to do and that's why he shared the word and that's why he wrote the word like this and rehearsed that with them. <clears throat> and so he begins. <clears throat> uh, I've read most of this, but I will bless the Lord at all times. And here, right from the beginning, David has just come from this situation where he's foolish, he's running from Saul and go, oh, you know, you understand, uh, you're going this way, but you're looking back at Saul, and therefore you're not noticing what you're walking into. And he's got the sword of Goliath and he walks into the camp of the Philistines looking for help. And, you know, and so he has to act crazy because he's brand new and he doesn't know how to do anything else yet. So he does foolish things and he acts stupid. He does stupid things. So David comes out of that situation, and you know, David did learn. He, he learned, but he comes out of that situation, and he said, you know what? I will bless the Lord at all times. That's all times. That's if I'm uh, uh, foolish, if I mess up, if I, if I do things that are not according to the Lord, like having to act like I'm insane to get out of this, scratching on the wall and slobbering, not very kingly. But I will bless the Lord at all times. That's his first words after the situation, after the inscription. Who drove him away and he departed to the cave of Abdullah. Mouth open, I will bless the Lord at all times. Don't you know, folks, if that wasn't David, if that was you, you would go into the depression. You would, you would feel guilty for failing God. You would freak out because you had not done it just right. <laughs> but did you have a comment? Or you just rested your arm? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, David, these, these 400 men were not with David when he did this thing in the, with the Philistines. But he wrote this as soon as he departed and got to the cave, and he wrote this sub superscription, and he probably read it to 400 people, and they said, What do you mean when you changed your behavior? And he said, I'm telling you, man, I did stupid things. I didn't know that at the time I thought it was a good idea. Um, I thought, I didn't even think anything about walking in there with Goliath's sword. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. But I want you to know, no, ma no matter how bad I mess up, 
I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. And his praise is continually going to be in my mouth because he didn't mess up. Can I get amen on that? Sorry? Is this the, the, the outcast Yeah. Well, I thought it was cool because at this point it says in uh, verse 2 of 1 Samuel 22 that they were in distress, they were in debt, and they were discontent. Right. So all these discontents gathered to David, and instead of David being discontent because of his situation, they get a massive dose of let's love God, he is our portion. And and it begins to shape them in what the spirit of this kingdom is from the first thing. And a lot of time, if you want to gather people to you who are discontented, you, you, you pet their flesh. And you say things to their soul to calm them so they'll be joined to you for fleshly reasons. But right off the bat, David spoke to that discontentment by magnifying God and saying, He is our... And they, from the, their inception, they were birthed. Well, we're going to see that uh, more as we get into this. But if I didn't make it clear and... In, 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 1 Samuel 22 is what we were referring to last, last class, where they first gathered the 400, the, the mighty men that were not mighty men, they were discontented and indebted and outcasts, outlaws. outlaws. At that point, that's where the whole thing began and ended in 2 Samuel 22, where it ended, and David's dying words uh, honoring those men for their stand for the Lord and, and, uh, and holding fast to these things that he started with. And so, uh, verse 4 <clears throat> says, uh, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now remember, in 2 Samuel 21, verse 12, it says that he, uh, well, one of the verses says he was afraid of Saul. And then verse 12 says he was very much afraid. In fact, he was so afraid that it rubbed him bad enough to be sore afraid. <laughs> he was so, I mean, that's the King James. He was sore afraid. He was very much afraid. And yet, David's saying here, uh, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all, all my fears. Folks, David delivered himself from the circumstance. But God delivered him from his fears. That's what he says right here. He delivered me from my fears. My fears. Not the circumstance. You can be in a circumstance, and if he can deliver you from your fears, you're not as worried about the circumstance. It's just the way it works. Okay, and so... Um, Let's see, verse uh, 5 and 6, they looked unto him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. And David had every reason to be ashamed at this point, but he was not ashamed. Why? Because he looked into the face of the Lord and he saw, and, and the only way I know how to put this is to say, he saw in the face of the Lord how God saw him. And that's a big deal, folks. When you understand that God sees you in Christ, you'll quit worrying about how God sees you. And he looked to his face and was radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. And of course that word poor man is the, is the needy, is the, the one that is, um, has no resources of his own to get out anymore. And he put himself in that situation he delivered himself by acting mad, but he says, you know what? I have no resources to deliver myself. And he begins to change that he's way, his way of relating with God. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, God. sometimes God delivers you from your troubles, and your troubles are only imagined. You know, but God is good. And then verse, verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in him. This is the kind of deliverance he's talking about. That he tasted and saw that the Lord was good. And it started, it's like that honey that, that, that uh, Jonathan ate. His eyes brightened. And uh, 
all of the king's commandment, and King Saul is represented by the law at that point, saying, don't eat this honey or whatever. And he ate it, and his eyes were enlightened. Revelation came. And he was strong. And everyone else was weak because of the law and the restraints that the law put on you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then taste and see, because this is... Uh, uh, taste and see, verse 8, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. It's this kind of deliverance. Tasting and seeing. Trusting in him that is this kind of deliverance. It is trust for a soul that needs to be delivered. Um, and, the, and in truth, this word, trusteth, is actually the word takes refuge. All right. You say, well, what's the point of showing us that Hebrew thing? Well, the point is, there's two kinds of trusting. There's probably a bunch of different kinds. There's the average Christian kind of trusting that says, I will trust you, Lord. I'll trust you. I'll trust you. And there is God's kind that says, I will take refuge in union with the Lord. I will be covered over by his feathers. You know, he says, if you, I, you know. He wept over Jerusalem and said, I would have gathered you as a mother hen. They take refuge under his feathers. I've said that long, long time ago. The most powerful objects on the planet are, are feathers. God's feathers. Because when you get under there, you're, you're in, in a refuge. But that represents... Being in union with him, not found having your own righteousness, which will not stand, but, but being in union with him in that manner. <clears throat> and then verse 9 and 10. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no lack to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Okay? And of course, the, the, in verse 9, Oh, fear the Lord. He's beginning to introduce something here that he's going to spend the next, well, he's going to spend verse 11 on down trying to explain to his men, trying to explain to his foundation what he holds as the most important thing, and apparently God backed him up on it. Um, but it is... This thing of changing strength, like Isaiah 40, where you are no longer trusting in your ability to get through stuff by acting crazy or acting smart. Change strength and begin to rely on the Lord as life and as strength and drawing from Him. And then... Um, and he, of course, in verse 10, he says, the young lions do lack. And I remembered seeing a, a PBS show about the Serengeti and lions. And I remember when it, it, it started with the rain starting to fall and the, the desert blooming, the Sahara Desert blooming, and then came all of these uh, zebras and, and antelope and all this stuff. And then it had this long thing about the lions feeding off of the, all of these things, all this food that was brought into the area. But then when winter started coming, the grasses died and those kind of animals left, but the lions were still there. And, there, and so it followed this, this uh, um, pride of lions, uh, this family of lions for a you know, all the way through the, the fall and the winter and everything, and some of them started dying off. Even the young ones started dying. And there was only a few of them who made it all the way through to the next fall of the rains, or the next spring rains, and, and then the return of all, and then they began to eat and have want. But even the young lions do lack. You lack. The young lions lack. The strong, even the strong ones, even the, the ones who have power that you don't have, even they will come to a lack. 
but, and this will show you, but they who trust in the Lord, even though you go through lack, he will bring it about and take care of you eventually. They don't have that promise. They don't have that promise. The only promise they have is, is living strong and living rich. and everything. The only promise they have is from Obama. That there'll be a, a, a bunch of money given to help get them out. But God doesn't, God doesn't support the young lions, the rich. God takes care of those who trust in Him. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, verse 11 now. And I wanted to center on this because verse 11 is pivotal. Verse 11 is now full-fledged moving into this thing that he mentioned in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. Verse 11, come ye children and hearken unto me and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David is saying, men, you must learn the fear of the Lord. He's saying, you may be a fool. You may do things on your own by your flesh to get out of trouble. But don't do evil things to other people. Everybody listen. Everybody wake up. This is the, this is the pinnacle here. Verse 11. You may do foolish things like David just did. You may mess up. You may, uh, um, you may take your own hands and do something to get out of trouble. But David said, and this is what he's going to be saying, and you'll get it once we start reading it. Whatever you do, don't do evil things to other people. If you manipulate to save yourself, God, God can still work with you. If you, you know, falter and fail and stumble along, God will preserve you. But don't do evil things to other people or God's going to be your enemy. Be from evil. Amen. And, we're, and this, this is the main thing he's going to get into. Now, you have to understand where this came from. He just came from doing things that he's not proud of. Do you understand that? He did that. Yes. He's talking to people who have done bad things to people. Mm -hmm. He's trying to tell them that's got to go. I mean, he's just laying it down right there. Excellent. That stuff right there can't go on. Maybe we'll get more comments from here than the rest of that's right. That's exactly right. You know these people had, you know, their, part of their debts was probably their failures to, to live up to certain things and maybe even ripping off people. Because I know a lot of people that, that, were, that are in debt because they actually didn't pay rent and they didn't do this and it starts coming back on them and stuff like that. So I totally agree with that. He, his audience, and, and now you've got to see, you got to see this. David isn't just like preaching. David's preparing 400 men to stay with him the rest of his life and, and bring in the kingdom in a real way, not in a Saul way. Does that make sense? And so he's starting from the first, and he's not, and when he gets into this, he's not going to say, you know, uh, what's important is that you, you know, don't get into debt or you don't do this or you don't do that. He's going to start right with the main thing, and he's going to say, look, we do not get on the offensive and go rip people's heads off. Addressing core issues versus That's stuff. Yeah. Nisa said he said addressing core issues instead of stuff because this is, this will be the, let's put it this way, it'll be the core of the kingdom because it's the core of David. Joab, that's what made, made Joab's actions later on so abominable to David was as his commander in chief, he went out and killed a couple different guys, Abner and I think Amasa or Abishai, one of those, I forget which. And, 
And um, he had Solomon deal with him after right. he died. That's and he right. needed to deal with Joab because he shed the blood of war in peace. And that's going against this very foundation thing right here. So he never changed. Amen. Amen. And, and uh, the amazing thing in this psalm is this is it now. I mean, he, he got over his praise stuff now. And now he's, he's no longer a worshiper. He's become a teacher. Do you understand? Do you, I mean, that's because he says it right there in verse uh, uh, 11. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. In other words, I'm going to teach you what it is. <laughs> right? I'm going to teach you what it is so that you're, you're, this is not unclear to you. Um, what man is he that desires? life and loveth many days that he may see good and then he begins to describe this and uh, i wrote there learn what the fear of the lord entails and see a blessed life the fear of the lord is is the core of of his kingdom and so verse 13 keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking god wait verse 14 depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it all right the next one's going to be the eyes of the Lord are looking for this stuff. Okay, but we're not ready to read that. We want to see what the fear of the Lord is. Folks, the fear of the Lord isn't that you haven't lied as long as you're not lying about someone else. Get it? Anybody, anybody here ever told a lie? Amen. Amen. Several, several. I noticed Mike, Mike's went all the way to heaven. <laughs> but I mean, you know, there are sins and there are sins. There are sins that, that don't attack, that don't hurt somebody else's reputation. Am I right? That don't do bad things to people. And there are things that, sure, they're self-protection. They're wrong. David and they're wrong, but he said, the Lord will preserve you. Yes, so, this, so, so now he's describing it specifically. Keep your tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. And this is, don't be malicious against other people. Okay? Uh, and then, that's, that, that, I mean, that just strictly relates to the tongue, that verse. The next verse relates to the actions. Because tongue and actions, let me tell you, once you verbalize something, you've opened the door to the enemy. I mean, I, I've said this my whole Christian life, and it's not based on anything I learned in, you know, Kenneth Copeland or anything else. Be careful what you say. Be careful because you open the door to stuff that you cannot imagine by speaking stuff that you shouldn't speak, you know. And, that, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, what did Jesus say? B you know, he that says thou fool is in danger of hell fire. But then Jesus was talking about somebody and he said thou, thou fool. <laughs> Paul said, thou fool. Okay, so what's the deal there? Pardon? What's your motive? And if your motive is coming against people, if you're just trying to tear people down, then, but there's no, I want you to know, there's no magic in words. You understand what I'm saying? There's no magic in words. This isn't a spooky, oh, you said the word. You know, there's no magic in, but there is in releasing something with your words or by your words, whereby, I mean, you know, you can say stuff about yourself, other people or whatever, and a floodgate of the enemy can start coming in. I'm just, I, all right, I can't explain it all. I'm just going to tell you, I think that you'd be a wiser person. And the scriptures say that, you know, even a fool, if he holds his tongue, you know, here's God saying, even a fool, oops, I shouldn't have said that. Thou fool. Even a fool, if he holds his tongue, is wise. It's just, you know, God gave us a tongue for grace, to speak grace, and that we might edify our 
listeners. That's in the book of Ephesians that says that. Use your tongue to bless and curse not. Bless. He said that. Okay. So I, I, I just, you know. Yes, Scott? Yeah, you know, I'm teaching out of the line of prophets right now, so that's kind of where my, my mind and heart is. But, you know, one of the things you see all through those books is that, that God's judgment comes upon the nations around Israel because of their, of their treatment of Israel. God's judgment comes on Israel because of their treatment for one another. Amen. Amen. Well said. Um, we touched on some of this also today in today's class, which are earlier class. Well, and in uh, verse 13 says, keep that tongue from evil. Verse 14 says, you depart from evil or depart from lions with sharp teeth that rip people's flesh. And you know, I mean, a lion rips your flesh. Do you have flesh? Sure, we all do. Lions want to rip that flesh. And lions don't want anybody else coming at them or they'll come at you. Okay? So, uh, depart from lions. But not just that, do good unto others. Seek peace and pursue it. Okay? You, you sort of getting the point from that? And then verse um, 15, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. And I want you to know that he's staying within context here. The righteous here is not someone who does everything perfect or keeps the law. The righteous is in his mind, those in this, in this psalm, in his mind, those who are following the fear of the Lord. And God's eyes are upon you, and God is looking to you. Um, and of course, we know that that's also because you're in union with Christ because it said that earlier. Uh, depart from, let's see, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. Okay, why their cry? Because they're going to be attacked, but they're not going to attack. Now, if I could get, if, if that was all you ever took out of this Bible school, It would bless so many other churches and church people long after we're gone. I would just be happy with that. You know, I, you know, my standards used to be way up here. I want to pray for him real quick. Amen. Cover him in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, and then verse 16. Notice how it just keeps moving. The, the eyes of the Lord, it says. Uh, the face of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord are upon. The face of the Lord is against. You see that? 15 and 16. The eyes of the Lord are looking on you. The face of the Lord is against those who, what? Do evil. Learn the fear of the Lord, which is not doing evil, and his face is against you to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And I want you to start noticing that David is talking to the rejects of the world. And he seems to be okay with them. The only thing he's not okay with is people that jump up and just attack someone else. He's not okay with that. And so he's, he's set his piece, and now he's going to start marking a line. It's almost like, I, you know, remember at the Alamo, and they say, you know, William Travis marked a line and says, you know, you that want to go home, step across that line. Well, he's saying, you that don't want to go with the fear of the Lord, you're going to step across this line and, and it's going to be bad because he's starting to describe, he says, the face of the Lord is going to be against, against, against. You want the face of the Lord against you? My God, how many of you love Jesus? Raise your hand. How many of you plan on loving Jesus for the rest of your life? How many of you need to hold your tongue and, and 
Shut up to the glory of God. <laughs> Amen. I mean, it's simple. It's not difficult. This isn't rocket scientist, you know, science. It's, it's not even, you know, chemistry 101, you know. It's just real basic stuff. And so, so then he, he switches back again. Uh, the righteous cry, and again, see, the righteous cry, why? Because just because you're not doing evil to other people doesn't mean you still won't have trouble. Do you understand? The, the righteous are not devoid of problems. Okay? The righteous are not devoid of problems. The righteous cry. Anybody ever cried before? Well, the righteous cry. They're, they do. And the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles, but again, not instantly, because he's working more in us than to prove that he can take care of things. Yes. Well, the Lord's Amen. Well, and what we've really noticed a whole lot of here is that the Lord has delivered David from his fears. Even when David put his hand and delivered himself, that he delivered him from his fears. The Lord is near unto those who are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. There's much to say on that, but I've already said some things in other classes. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Does this sound familiar to anybody? <clears throat> let, me, let me just make a comment from my notes here. Uh, I wrote the righteous cry, they, are not, they do not avoid, but are brought through. This is not coming up with schemes to get out of trouble, like acting crazy. This is, this is watching the Lord bring you through it, okay? Um, who, does draw, who does God draw near? And this is him drawing us near. My God, if, if I talk to all of Christianity right now, if I had a mezzanine audience, I would say, who would want to draw near to God? And everyone would go, yeah, yeah, me, 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 me. Folks, he said, here's who the Lord draws near unto. The Lord is near unto those who have a broken heart and a save as such as of a contrite spirit. Folks, this broken heart and contrite spirit is the worst enemy of evil and of what these lions have in their heart. But it is the friend of God. It is closer than being the friend of God. <clears throat> I, I wrote a bunch of scriptures here, but I'm not going to give them. I, I will quote Isaiah 51, 17, where it says, Isaiah 51, 17 mentions a broken heart and a, and a contrite spirit. And it says that a broken spirit is a sacrifice. It's, it's a burnt offering. It's a burnt offering. It was not about giving animal sacrifices, but their, uh, but their cutting up and death represented something. It represented Christ, but it also represented the believer in brokenness, Offering himself up in the death that God requires. And I, I was thinking about this this morning. How this is exactly what the beginning of, of the gospel, the beginning of reality, as it, the light finally dawned in the New Testament, when Mary gave birth to Jesus. And she gave birth, and Simeon, said and was moved on by the Holy Spirit and said, um, this child shall be set for the rising or for the fall and rising of many. He'll be a stumbling block to many in Israel. And he, and 
I forget the wording of it, but it says something about, and his sign will be contradicted, basically, is what it meant in the, in the Greek as I looked at it. And it was saying, it was spelling out that from the very beginning, Mary and Joseph are hearing these words, and even though everybody's running around praising and all this stuff in the temple, there are these words saying, this is not just going to be fun, you're going to partake of the sufferings that Christ goes through, and even you, Mary, with all of his rejection, your own soul will be pierced because the very thing that you brought forth out of you, that you brought forth to give life and blessing to the world, was rejected and turned on, and it's going to kill you that they turn on the very thing that you, you meant for life and blessing to everybody else. Even your own soul shall be pierced through. <clears throat> and so... Uh, this broken spirit is deeply touched. Deeply touched. David was deeply touched and wanted to reach these men and cared for them. Let me see. I, gotta, I need to get this, this class done. So verse 19 <clears throat> um, says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out. And I wrote, Many are the afflictions. Many, not of the wicked, who live contrary to God, but of those who try to do it right and put God first instead of themselves. <laughs> I mean, at least, we're, at least what we're going through is because we're making a stand for Jesus. Amen? I mean, I saw a movie the other night that reminded me of my childhood and the years growing up, and I remembered it all flashed back that it was like a madhouse. Both of my parents were alcoholics. They fought. They threw stuff. They tore the place up. They were drunk. The place smelled like alcohol all the time. It was crazy. And then and I was watching this, and I went, oh, my God. And I remember the tenseness just started coming into my body as I watched it and remembered how bad that was. And then I thought of my present situation, and I thought, you know, I'm not near as tense as I was back then. I mean, I don't like what I'm going through, but I tell you what, I don't like what's going on. But I tell you what, it's not near as bad as my BC days. And I thought, I, you know, I'm, I'm just blessed, Lord. You know, forgive me, Lord. I'm just going to bless you at all times. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> um, so, and then uh, we went over some of these in another psalm, but he says, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. I love that verse because of several things. I won't get into the bones and the bride part right now, but I will say this. <laughs> About the only thing wasn't broken in him was his bones. You know, but we read that and we go, I praise God, not a bone broken, you know. Well, they shoved a spear in his side, they slapped him, they, you know, nailed him up there and they killed him. But at least his bones weren't broken. Praise God. You know, my point is, many times we romanticize everything. We don't really see the full picture that's going on there. And then... Uh, <laughs> I wrote, the blessing is that Though you're mocked, slapped, and wounded and killed, he doesn't let them break your bones. <laughs> okay. And then verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked. There it is again. We've seen this so many times in the Psalms, folks. Here, I'm going to ask you to do this. Believe it. Let me just say it like this. If you think that they get they're going to get away with this stuff, they're not. Can I get an amen? amen? If you think they're going to get away, they're not. God will slay the wicked. Doesn't, doesn't even have to. Their own evil will slay them. Okay? Just need to remember that. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. And then, uh, let me just make sure. Oh, I put evil shall slay the wicked, but, but goodness will bring you to a cross and rejection. Okay? Their problem of evil and wickedness is not that of rank sinners 
who do who do perverse things, but those of the the but those who the only thing wrong is that they persecute and hate God's people. Maybe even in the name of loving God, they do that. Because here, here's why he's bringing this up. Because it's they don't know the fear of the Lord. That's why. I mean, it's coming right down to the last, next verse is the last verse. We'll, we'll take a break. They don't know the fear of the Lord. And he's still trying to explain it to these men so that the first lesson, and do you think this is the only time David's going to bring this subject up? No. Okay. And then uh, verse 22. The Lord redeemeth the soul. Have you ever had soul affliction? You can have outward affliction and your soul be afflicted bigger than the outward. Okay? He shall redeem the soul. Thank God, man. Most of us need our souls redeemed. We say, well, you know, I want to go out and win souls. Folks, you don't win souls. You win spirits. You win their spirit till they get born again in their spirit. Their soul still needs saving. <laughs> Amen. So the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them who trust in him shall be desolate. Um, what needs redemption is not his spirit, for that is redeemed. It is not a prayer to save the ungodly, because they are, uh, because they are so wicked, but redemption for you, for your soul. Amen? Okay, let's take a break. We'll come back.